Hey, welcome to Grace Church Online. My name is Matt and I'm the online director here at Grace. We're here to help you, your friends and neighbors know and follow Jesus. Today, we're wrapping up a teaching series that we've been in for the last few weeks called Fear Not. You know, in our world today, it's pretty much the norm to live with fear and anxiety. But the Bible actually has a lot to say about our fears because that's not the kind of life that God wants for us. Today, we're we'll be hearing from our lead pastor, Sean, as he talks about how to navigate the times in life where choosing to do the right thing just doesn't feel like the right thing. Sometimes it's easier to ignore doing what we know is right because, well, we're afraid that we might lose too much. So what are we supposed to do? Let's hear from Pastor Sean. Fear is something that every single one of us experience. You've experienced this since you were a little baby. Uh, when you cried for the first time because of a loud noise or a barking dog or uh, a honking horn or the first time you got on an airplane or tried to cross the street uh, alone for the first time or maybe walked to school by yourself, uh, we've, we've always felt Fear, I mean, it's not always been the most dominant emotion, but I think fear has always been a part of, of our emotional makeup since we were little. As we got older, those fears just evolved, but I don't know that the fears ever disappeared. I mean, even now as a grown man with three grown children, I still struggle with fear. What if, what if I'm not going to ever be ready for retirement? What if physically something happens to me and my, and my wife is on her own? Or when the kids were smaller, what if something happened to me and then my wife wouldn't be able to on her own income be able to support the kids? And, uh, not too long ago, I, I had surgery and, uh, then I, I had, you know, there's blood tests. And then when the doctor calls and says, I need you to come in for a meeting, I mean, that, that brings up a whole different set of fears that I was completely unfamiliar with and until that happens. So the idea that fear is a part of our life is common to every single one of us. It's just what we fear is different at each stage in our life. There's been a, um, a theme to the, to this series though. Uh, the, 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 like a guiding principle, and that's this, uh, that the greater your fear of the Lord, the less you have to fear anything else. The idea behind that is that the more respect uh, that you have for God and His authority over the world, uh, the more uh, you, you acknowledge the goodness of God, even in the badness of life, the more confidence you'll have even in times of uncertainty that could potentially create in you these feelings of fear. When I recognize that God saw this coming, that God can work this into the story, that God is good even if this bad thing does happen and it doesn't derail the story that God's trying to write with my life, that confidence in God, the fear of the Lord, the respect and and uh, uh, awe, the reverence that I have of God can be the thing that helps me uh, keep fear from being the deciding factor in the choices that I make in my life. So we talked about the way that that plays out in our fear of what other people think in week one. In week two, we talked about our fear of failure. And here in week three, uh, we had a hard time coming up with like, like, which fear is this? Is this the fear of rejection? Because the answer is yes. Is this the fear of standing out? Yes. The fear of not fitting in? Yes. The fear of death? Yes, it's that. Is it the fear of the unknown? Yes, it's the fear of the unknown. It's the fear of confrontation. Like we had a hard time like saying, okay, what is the one fear common in the story that we're looking at today? Uh, uh, because there were so many different fears it addresses. But behind every one of those fears, I think is the fear of loss. So that's what we decided to focus on. It's the fear of loss. There's gonna be four main characters in the story that we're looking at today. And we're going to go through uh, the story as though we were skimming through a play in high school or talking about a movie that has six different scenes. So there's an act one, an act two, uh, three, four, five, and six. And we're going to be looking at this story uh, through that lens uh, today. And we're going to see what we learn about the fear of loss. So if you've got your Bible, I want you to go to the book of Esther. Esther. Esther chapter one, and uh, it only has 10 chapters. Uh, we're not gonna read the whole thing. We, we are going to be skimming through it, but here is uh, the ID be behind um, act one. 
uh, Esther chapter one, verse one through three says, these events happened in the days of King Xerxes. Now you can look him up on Wikipedia or in an encyclopedia. I don't know if anybody really even has those anymore. And you'll find out that he became king in 486 BC. Uh, but here's what it says. These events happened in the days of King Xerxes who reigned over 127 provinces stretching from India uh, to Ethiopia. At that time, Xerxes ruled uh, his empire from his royal throne at the fortress of Susa. And in the third year of his reign, which would have been 486 BC, he gave a banquet for all of his nobles and officials from all 127 provinces. So this would have been like one of the biggest parties in the history of the world at that. Like I'd, I don't even know if there's ever been a party this big even since then. So from India all the way over into Africa and these 127 provinces, all of the officials and all of the nobles come to the capital city of Susa in Persia for this gigantic party. He invited all of the military officers of Persia and media, as well as the princes and nobles of the provinces. Holy cow. Like this is like this is like a really big gathering. This thing is is gigantic, and the party lasts. Uh, you, you, if you if you keep reading in the scriptures, and we're not going to do that for the sake of time. I told you we weren't going to read every verse. This party lasts 180 days. So in a like a 30 day month, this is a six month long. Like this party lasts. Like if you thought people have stayed over, over overstayed their welcome for your birthday party because they didn't leave until like you know midnight or one or two in the morning, th this <laughs> this is overkill. So this is who knows how many hundreds or thousands of people show up for this party, and it is a six month long party. At the end of the party, he throws a seven day party with uh, all of those invited guests, but this time it's for. Uh, the people in the capital city. So the capital city throws a party for everybody all over from India to Ethiopia. And then the last seven days is the party that everybody else is throwing for the people who were throwing the party, which is which is kind of a cool thing to do, I think. But at, at the end, the very last day, uh, the king is, I mean, he's out of control at this point. It's been a little bit over six months. And, and he calls for his wife, the queen, Queen Vashti. And he tells Queen Vashti to come in to show off all of her beauty. And she's not going to do this. Uh, you can probably imagine what he meant by this, and then you can understand why she said no. And now he's, he's embarrassed. Um, so he dethrones her, he banishes her, essentially is what he does. And then he, and then he has a pageant where he, he, he tells these 120 officers, military officers, nobles, and princes from these 127 provinces, when you go back, I want you to find the most attractive and highest quality women in your province and send them here, and I'm going to pick one of them to replace Queen Vashti. Okay, like there's there's themes here that we're not going to have time uh, to address, and um it's a really awkward thing for it to put in the Bible, but it's in there because it actually it actually happened. But right after they announced that this is going to happen, we're introduced to the second character of the story. So the, the first character in the story is um, King Xerxes. Second guy in the, uh, in the story is a guy who's a gatekeeper at the palace. That's his job. Uh, he's, he works for the king, not high up, doesn't have close access to the king. He's simply the gatekeeper. He's the one who checks people's IDs and makes sure they're on the get, the guest list uh, when they come in into the palace. And his name is Mordecai. Uh, all we know is that he's a gatekeeper and that he's a, a Jewish man. Now he's brought up because he has a cousin. Uh, it's, his, it's his dad's brother's daughter and she's much younger than he is. And both of her parents have died. And so he's now become her protector, her provider, kind of like um, her legal guardian. And, and here's what it says about her. It says that uh, she is his younger cousin and was very beautiful and lovely. And her name is Esther. And so now we have the first three of the four characters of the story of, of Esther. So you've got King Xerxes. You got the gatekeeper who's a Jewish man who has a very beautiful and lovely younger cousin named Esther. Esther is brought before the king 
also. So she's put into the harem. She's there for a year. After a year of preparation, probably coaching on her and how to behave uh, with the king um, as a royal and all of that stuff, she's brought before the king. And here's what it says in Esther chapter 2, verse 10. Esther had not told anyone of her nationality, being Jewish, and family background, being Jewish, because Mordecai had told her not, not to do so. So I don't, we don't know why Mordecai tells Esther to hide her Jewishness, but it's the instructions he gives her, probably uh, as her older protector, there had to be some kind of reason uh, that involved her, her safety uh, and her prosperity there. So he told her to hide that part. Verse 11 says, every day, day Mordecai would take a walk near the courtyard of the harem to find out about Esther and what was happening to her. So even though she was chosen by the uh, what, whatever one of the 127 provinces that he's from, uh, the prince of his province picked his, 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 uh, his cousin. Uh, and he had no say in the matter, but he, he made sure to keep checking up on her. In verse 16 of chapter 2, we find out that Xerxes, of all of the hundreds or thousands of women uh, that he tries out, and it's a really awkward thing, right? Uh, uh, Esther's the one that he chooses to become, to become queen. And here's what it says, and this is a quote. It says that uh, Xerxes loved Esther more than any of the other young women. He was so delighted with her that he set the royal crown on her head and declared her queen instead of Vashti. End act one. All right, like that's, that's the end of the first scene. Uh, there's a gigantic party. The king asks uh, his queen to do something inappropriate. She says no. He replaces her with Esther, a Jewish girl, whose older cousin, who is her guardian, legal guardian, happens to be a gatekeeper. Now we go to Act 2. And this is in Esther chapter 2, verse 21. One day, as Mordecai was on duty at the king's gate, two of the king's units, personal assistants, Bigthana and Teresh, who were guards at the door of the king's private quarters, or his private chambers, became angry at King Xerxes and plotted to assassinate him. But Mordecai heard about the plot and gave the information to Queen Esther. And then she told the king about it and gave Mordecai credit for the report. Then you'll find out in the rest of chapter two that there's an investigation that's done uh, on, on those two uh, eunuchs and the story that Esther had told them from, from um, Mordecai was true. And these two, these two eunuchs are impaled on, on stakes and, and die. Uh, then the last thing that it says at the end of Act 2, or the second part of the story, is that what Mordecai had done was written in the book of the history of King Xerxes' reign. It's a historical record of his life, uh, the laws that he had written and the things that he had, he had done. Uh, and the story of what Mordecai had done was included in, in that book. Now we go to scene three, Act 3. The king promotes one of the nobles. It's a completely different part of the story now. So the king's got all, remember, he's got 127 provinces. Each one of these provinces have princes, nobles, and military leaders that were all included at this party uh, uh, in, in, in chapter one. He takes one of them and he promotes them, elevates that guy above all of the other uh, nobles. So he now becomes like the king's prime minister. Like he's the number one. He is the right hand of the king is what he becomes. And his name is Haman. And he's the fourth and final character in the story of Esther. Uh, the king instructed when he promoted uh, Haman as prime minister that everywhere Haman went throughout his kingdom, that people had to bow in respect to Haman whenever he rode by them. But there was one guy who would never bow. Uh, he wouldn't bow uh, to, to Haman, and that was Mordecai. Baba doesn't give us much of an explanation for this. Other than that, he's Jewish, because part of the Jewish law is that you don't bow down and worship of anyone other than, other than God. So Mordecai couldn't bow down to him and still be faithful to God. Uh, Esther chapter 3, verse 8 to 9, um, it, it inflames Haman. He, he cannot stand 
to be disrespectful. I mean, it doesn't matter that 99.9999999% of all the Persians in the entire world bow every time he walks into the room. He can't get past the idea that there's one person who won't do it. Now, he finds out that Haman is Jewish. And here's what happens in Esther chapter 3, verse 8 and 9. Then Haman approached King Xerxes and said, there's a certain race of people scattered through all the provinces of your empire who keep themselves separate from everyone else. And because their, their dietary laws were different, if you've read the Torah, uh, their worship was different because they worshiped the one true God rather than the many gods of the Persians. He said their laws are different from those of any other people and they refuse to obey the laws of the king. They were law-abiding citizens. They just wouldn't worship the gods of the king or bow down to Haman, and that's what he didn't like. So it is not in the king's interest, Haman says, to let them live. Verse 9, if it please the king, issue a decree that they be destroyed. And if you do, I'll give 10,000 large sacks of silver to the government administrators to be deposited in the royal treasury. So not, not only does he say to the king, listen, king, it's in your best interest to destroy this entire race of people. But if you happen to see things the way I do, uh, I'll also throw in 10 gigantic sacks of silver. Now, I, how much money is that worth? Like, I, I have absolutely no idea. We don't know how big, big these bags of silver are, except that Haman just describes them as really big, large sacks of silver. So I don't know if the king agrees to this because he really believes it's in his best interest or if the king agrees to this because he'd really like to have all of the wealth that Haman and his family have been storing up. But verse 12 says, so on April 17th, the king's secretaries were summoned and a decree was written exactly as Haman dictated. It was sent to the king's highest officers, the governors of the respective provinces, all 127 and the nobles of each province in their own scripts and in their own languages. The decree was written in the name of King Xerxes and was sealed with the king's signet ring and could not be changed. Now they picked a day, and this is important for history. The way that they pick the date uh, is through a dice. And they, they spun the dice, and the dice help them come to the date of March 17th uh, of the, or March 7th of the following year. So remember, this is in April. Um, and then, so 11 months from now is when all of the Jews scattered throughout all the, the world at that point uh, were going to be, were going to be killed. Uh, Mordecai finds out about the decree and, and he's, he's upset. He's beside himself. And he asks Esther, you've got to go to the king and tell him not to do this. And here's Esther's response in Esther chapter four, verse 11. Uh, all the king's officials, she says, and even the people in the provinces know that anyone who appears before the king in his inner court without being summoned is doomed to die. Like the punishment for going and talking to the king without being asked to come to the king, like the punishment for that is death. Like, like I can't, what you're asking me to do uh, Mordecai is, is impossible. Like, you can't ask me to do this. It, the, the price is, is too steep. It's too difficult. Uh, and the king has not called for me to come to him for 30 days now. So it's been 30 days since she's been invited to go into the king's presence. Uh, and she goes, I, I can't just like walk in there because the punishment for that is death. Verse 13. Mordecai's response to her is this. Mordecai sent this reply to Esther. Don't think for a minute that just because you're in the palace, that you're going to escape when all the other Jews are killed. He's so like, listen, like, I know right now you feel that your position exempts you from the consequences of this law, but don't think you're going to escape without this affecting you. Verse 14, if you keep quiet at a time like this, deliverance and relief for the Jews will surely arise from some other place, but your relatives are going to die. Uh, who knows if perhaps you were made queen for just such a time as this. Um, the King James Bible says, who knows if you weren't brought to this for such a time as this. That's how I've always heard that phrase, for, for such a time as this. And maybe you've heard that phrase before, and, and here's where it comes from. Verse 15, then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go and gather together all the Jews and uh, of Susa, 
and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. Uh, my maids and I will do the same. And then, though it is against the law, I will go see the king. And if I die, I must die. If I must die, then I must die. Like, that's like this really climactic moment where she considers the consequences of her choices and she realizes that while this could be a bad thing for everybody else, there might be a way for her not to have to get involved in this. Uh, but truthfully, if she gets involved in this and everybody's going to die anyway, why do I want to also be thrown? Like, the odds of this working out are, are very slim, but this wasn't about whether or not this was gonna work out in her favor. This is about what was the right thing to do? And it was an unbelievably difficult choice for her to make. And maybe you've been in a situation where you, you were given the opportunity to do the right thing that you didn't have to do. But if you did this, this, I mean, there was a very high probability that things would not work out for you. Like, what do you do when you're asked to do something that even if you think it's the right thing to do that you know for sure won't benefit you or even worse, you know for a fact, will disadvantage you. Do you go ahead and do the right thing? Um, that's the end of Act 3. So we're halfway through the story. Act 4, scene 4, Esther chapter 5, verse 1 through 4. On the third day of that three-day fast, Esther put on her royal robes and entered the inner court of the palace. And like, if we're watching this as a movie, it just got really quiet, and all you can hear are the click, 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 click of her shoes, uh, right? Or if she's not wearing heeled shoes, you're hearing like it's so quiet because she just walked into the king's throne room without permission. Like anybody else is in the room was asked to be in the room and they all know the rules for being in this room. So they get invited, they're all in the room, the door opens up and nobody else is expected. So then they turn, like I'm wondering, like was there like, a, <gasps> like who would dare interrupt this board meeting that the king is having or this, council uh, that the king is is putting together to make this whatever decision and the doors just open up and this this tiny girl just walks in like I'm wonder like I want to see what her face looks like is she looking down is she trying to be quiet is she like walking in like this like her, her chin up like is like I'm wanting to see her like I'm dying to see her posture because in my head I can see this playing out in several different ways but I guarantee you the room went just like stone dead silent because it's the queen who's broken the law. Like this isn't like a, a gatekeeper walking in. That dude's getting killed right away. Now the king's already banished one queen and everybody knows how much he adores Queen Esther, but she's just done the un unpardonable sin. Like she walked into the king's throne room without permission and it goes dead silent and everybody's wanting to see, holy crap, what in the world is the king gonna do to this girl? So on, on the third day of the fast, Esther put on her royal robes and entered the inner court of the palace, just across from the king's hall. The king was sitting on his royal throne, facing the entrance. Verse two. When he saw Queen Esther standing there in the inner court, what does he do? Uh, right? Like ten, that's tension. He welcomes her and he holds out the golden scepter to her for her to touch. And that meant that, did you remember playing freeze tag when you were a kid? Or playing tag and then like, you know, like something was base? Like the tree was base, like in my, in my house, uh, we get all the kids on the street would play would play tag, but we always had base, and base is something that you could you could hold on to, and if you held on to that, then you couldn't get in trouble. And essentially, the king's scepter was was base, so she walks in and she can die, right? Like anything could happen, but he sticks out that that scepter to her, and and she grabs it, and everybody everybody in the room is like. <sighs> Right, because like that, that was like, that was really scary. That's what that was. Then the king asked her, verse three, what do you want, Queen Esther? What is your request? I will give it to you, even if it is half of my kingdom. Holy cow, because now he's on record and he just told her he would give her half of his entire kingdom. Like that's, bro, that's license that nobody who's a part of this service has ever had, right, up to half of my kingdom. And Esther replied, if it please the king, then let the king and Haman come today to a banquet that I have prepared for the king. Okay, 
Remember, she hasn't eaten in three days, but what she has been doing is preparing for this banquet. I don't know if she came up with this idea on her own. Did she come up with the idea with the help of Mordecai? The Bible doesn't say. But the king tells her he can have, she can have anything she wants, up to half of his kingdom, and all she asks is for the king and Haman to come to a dinner that she's prepared for them that night. So the king invites Haman to Esther's banquet and asks what she wants. And here's what she says. She says, I want tomorrow night for only you and Haman to come to one more banquet. So apparently there was more people in the room than what Esther was comfortable with. So she asked for this banquet. He comes, but it's not the setting that she wants. So she says, he says, what do you, what do you want? So why did you have the banquet? What do you, what do you really want? She says, what I really want is to have a meal with just you and Haman tomorrow night, and then I'll tell you what I want. So that night, Haman is flying high. He goes home, and you can you can read this in the story, Acts chapter five, but he goes home, and he's, he's bragging to his wife on, like, his whole world is coming together. You know what I'm saying? Like, he's now the right hand of the king, even, and this is what he says, even Queen Esther, wants my counsel and wants to be around me. And then his wife goes, this is your chance to get rid of Mordecai. Like, like when you go in there and you get an audience with them tomorrow night, you need to ask him straight up, can I kill Mordecai? Because if the queen likes you this much, you can ask anything you want and he's gonna give it to you. So what he does that night, like right after he's had dinner with Esther, the, the Bible says that he has his servants build a stake in the ground 75 feet high and he's going to impale Mordecai on the top of that so that everybody in Susa sees his impaled body. That, that's what it's, it says he's talking about with his wife that night. Now, back in the palace, the king can't sleep. Bob doesn't say why, but he goes to bed, can't fall asleep, and he has some of his servants come out and read from the book of King of, of the book of the history of King Xerxes. Rain. Do you remember what story's in there? The story about Mordecai. So the story about Mordecai finding out about this assassination plot and then spoiling the plot by giving that information to the queen and then the queen giving that to the other guards, the investigation being done, found out to be true and that Mordecai had saved the king's life. Um, I don't know if this is the first time that he's heard this story, because maybe it didn't come all the way to his throne room before, but now he's hearing the story. And then so he asked the guys who are reading the story to him, he says, was anything, was anything done for him as a reward for saving my life? And the stewards that are reading the book say, says, no, it, it wasn't. So it's been all night long. They've been reading from this. The last thing that the king has done is he's asked, what was done for Mordecai as a reward for saving me, for saving my life? And they said nothing. Uh, it's starting to become dawn. And, uh, uh, Haman has come to the, the courthouse, or excuse me, to the, to the palace, uh, because his wife has said, first thing tomorrow morning, that's what she had said, uh, go ask the king if you can kill Mordecai. Uh, and so he's coming in the very next day to ask the king uh, if he can kill Mordecai. So the king hears somebody walking around out in the courtyard. And so here's what happens in chapter 6, Esther 6, verse 4. Uh, Who is that in the outer court? The king inquired. As it happened, Haman had just arrived in the outer court of the palace to ask the king to impale Mordecai on the pole that he had prepared. So the attendants replied to the king, it's Haman. Haman is out in the court. We'll bring him in, the king ordered. So Haman came in and the king said, what should I do to honor a man who truly pleases me? Haman thought to himself, whom would the king wish to honor more than me? So he replied, if the king wishes to honor someone, he should bring out one of the king's own royal robes as well as a horse that the king himself has ridden on. One with a royal emblem on its head. Let the robes and the horse be handed over to one of the king's other most noble officials and let him see that the man whom the king wishes to honor is dressed in the king's robes and led through the city square on the king's horse. Have the officials shout as they go, this is what the king does for someone that he wishes to honor. Now, he just said, what would I want done for me? And here's what the king says. The king says, excellent. The king said to Haman, verse 10, quick, take the robes, his robes, my robes, 
take my robes and my horse and do just as you have said for Mordecai the Jew who sits at the gate of the palace. Wah, wah, wah. Right? Like, oh gosh. I would just as much as I would have loved to have seen Esther walk in when everybody thought she was going to die. I would love to see Haman's face when he has to walk through the city square in Susa, the capital of Persia, walking Mordecai on the king's horse, shouting to everybody that this is the honored man and this is what God, or excuse me, what the king does for those that he, that he, uh, that he wants to honor. Oh, uh, man. And that's the end of Act 4. Uh, Act 5 is really short. Uh, that night, is the is Queen Esther's private banquet now? Now he goes home. Uh, you can you can read in uh, chapter six, and he tells his wife that he's humiliated. Uh, he said, "I had to do this for for Mordecai. I freaking hate him." And then the queen says, "Oh my word, this is the worst news possible. Like now he's untouchable. You you can never. You need like you need to be really careful now." Uh, um, so it's, that's what that happens. What happens? And he says, "And now I have to go back to this banquet tonight." So he goes to the banquet with Queen Esther and and uh, King Xerxes. Uh, at the end of the meal, Xerxes asks Esther what she wants, and then Esther says uh, that there is someone who is trying to kill her and all of her people. And the king and Haman are shocked by this. Remember, Haman doesn't know that she's Jewish. Haman doesn't even know that she's Mordecai's cousin. He just thinks she's Queen Esther. So they're both hearing for the first time that somebody wants to kill her and all of her people. And then Esther chapter 7 verse 5 says this, uh, Who would do such a thing, King Xerxes demanded? Who would be so presumptuous as to touch you? Esther replied, verse 6, This wicked Haman Right, she points right at him. This wicked Haman is our adversary and our enemy. <laughs> this is like the worst day that anybody has ever had in the history of the world because at that point, I guarantee you, like, like, like uh, Haman pooped his pants. He would have had to. Oh my gosh. Like this is the worst day ever. So the verse next says, Haman, Haman grew pale with fright before the king and queen. Then the king jumped to his feet in a rage and he went out to the palace garden to think, right? Like this is his prime minister. What am I supposed to do with this? He walks out into the palace garden. As soon as he goes out into the palace garden, it says, Haman, however, stayed behind to plead for his life with Queen Esther, for he knew that the king intended to kill him. In despair, he fell on the couch where Queen Esther was reclining just as the king was returning from the palace garden. Now it looks like he's attacking her. And the king exclaimed, will you even assault the queen right here in the palace before my very own eyes? And as soon as the king spoke, his attendants covered Haman's face, signaling his doom. They just put a bag over his head and dragged him out. Oh my gosh. That's like the most dramatic scene ever. Verse 9, then Harbona, one of the king's eunuchs, said, By the way, Haman has set up a sharpened pole that stands 75 feet tall in his own courtyard. He intended to use it to impale Mordecai, the man who saved the king from assassination. The king said, then impale Haman on it, the king ordered. So they impaled Haman on the pole that he had set up for Mordecai, and the king's anger subsided. That's like the end of scene five. So here's the last scene. The last scene is that they, they can't save the Jews because the king had already sealed the law that next year on March 7th, anybody anywhere in any of his provinces can kill any Jewish person that they want. What he does, though, is he adds an addendum. And the addendum says that on March 7th of that same year, anybody who attacks a Jewish person is then going to be attacked by all the Jewish people. And then the addendum even goes on to say that the Jews are now allowed to attack and destroy any of their enemies. And in chapter nine, that's exactly what happened. They, like anytime somebody came up against a Jewish person, the whole Jewish community rose up against them and defeated the entire enemy. Haman had, I think it's nine or 10 uh, sons. 
and and the Jews and Susa uh, killed all nine or ten of his sons and Susa so that he wouldn't try to avenge they wouldn't try to avenge their father by killing more Jews uh, and and then it says in Acts chapter excuse me Esther uh, chapter ten. Uh, verses one through three. Uh, King Xerxes imposed a tribute throughout his empire, even to the distant coastlands. Uh, his great achievements and the full account of the greatness of Mordecai, who the king promoted into Haman's old job, are recorded in the book of the history of the kings of Media and Persia. Mordecai the Jew became the prime minister with authority next to that of the king uh, Xerxes himself. He was very great among the Jews who held him in high esteem because he continued to work for the good of his people. See, that's the difference between him and, and Haman. He worked for the good of his people, whereas Haman was obsessed with the good of himself. And he continued to speak up for the welfare of all of their other descendants. Here's what's really cool, is that this story of God rescuing the Jews from Haman and from King Xerxes uh, is actually the genesis or the beginning of the start of the Jewish celebration of Purim. So if you've heard of Purim, by the way, it's it's March, I think it's March 22nd or March 17th, 2000, crap. It's March something in 2022. Uh, maybe I'll skim over it here in just a second in my notes. Uh, but this next March is gonna be Purim again. And it's Purim is the name of the dice that Haman used to spin uh, to decide randomly which date next year he was going to kill all of the Jews. So they now use the name of the dice Haman used to kill them. Uh, that is now the name of the celebration that they have every single year since 483 BC, or maybe it was a few years after that, or during the time of King Xerxes, uh, when God spared all of, all of the Jews. So here's what I wanna do. If it's okay, I'd like to like wrap up by giving you three observations generically from the book of Esther. And I'd like to give you one thing that I notice about each of the four characters. The first thing I, I, I observation from the book of Esther is this, that God is at work even if God, even if you can't see him. Esther is the only book in the Bible where God isn't even mentioned. And I think that that's a literary device that was used on purpose by Mordecai, if, as most scholars think, Mordecai is the one who, it's, it also says that Mordecai wrote down the deeds, all of these things that had happened. So that's why we think that Mordecai is the one who wrote the book of Esther. Um, but God's name isn't mentioned on purpose because there are times in our life when we don't see God at work. You, you might be in that season now where you're praying and you don't feel like God's there and you don't see the blessings of God, you don't see the work of God, you don't see the hand of God, and you feel like God is nowhere. And that is exactly the same position that the Jews were in. And what you need to know from the book of Esther is that just because you do not see God does not mean that God is not there. And just because you don't feel him doesn't mean that he's absent. Um, this book is a reminder to us that God is here, even is there with you, even when you don't see him. Uh, just because God is silent does not mean that God is absent. The second observation from the, the, the book of Ruth is that each hero in the story recognized that they were put there on purpose, uh, that they weren't there by accident. Esther and Mordecai both recognized that the position that I have, the resources, the opportunity, the experience, the position, right? Like what I have at my disposal, was not given to me by God just for myself. Um, it's not an accident. I don't have what I have by accident, and you are no more of an accident than Esther and Mordecai. Uh, Esther and Mordecai recognized that their blessings were tools that God had made, had given them uh, to make a difference. Um, and just like Esther, you were created for a time just like this. And what I wanna say is that who you are right now is who God intended you to be and the resources that you have are what God intends you to use right now um, for his glory and, and the good of others. The third observation from the book of Esther is that God is writing a bigger story than the page that you're reading right now. I, I can see my life and I can see this page that I'm on, but I need to remember that the page that my life is on isn't the only story that God is trying to write, but truthfully, the page that's being written with my life is a part of a bigger story that God intends me, me to play. Um, I noticed a few other thoughts like right is greater than wrong when people do what is right instead of what is wrong. 
Uh, I learned from Esther that it's always right to do the right thing, even if something bad might happen to you because of it. And and I'm, like part of that same thing is that God doesn't waste a plot twist. The thing that you're going through right now might not have been anticipated or something you would have included in the story. So you would say that what you're going through right now is a plot twist. And what I want you to know is that God doesn't waste those. God doesn't waste your pain and he'll use those for something bigger uh, in the long run. I want to leave you with one observation from each one of the characters, from Xerxes. He was indulgent and he lacked boundaries. Um, and, and one of the things that I learned from him is that making decisions based on how I feel is going to lead me to a life lived out of bounds. Uh, that's, where, that's where Xerxes was at. Um, he was hedonistic and his life was out of control. Um, I would say that boundaries are a sign of maturity. And the thing that I want you to remember from Xerxes is that wisdom is knowing when to tell yourself no. Um, I think the wise person knows uh, what guardrails even they should not go beyond. From Haman, uh, Haman was obsessed with one thing, his own success. And he thought that his path to success was paved uh, by his ability to control the people around him. Um, and others' lack of respect was seen as a personal threat. There are some of us, we just can't get past the idea that somebody doesn't like us or somebody won't give us respect. Um, and that's the spirit of Haman in us. And I think each one of us have that at different, at different times. Uh, Mordecai. Mordecai did not see his lack of authority as an excuse for passivity. I think some of us would say, I would do something if I was in charge, but I'm not in charge, so there's nothing I can do. And that's wrong. It's an excuse to not do anything. And if you see an injustice, right? Like, even though you're not in charge, you still have a responsibility to work for what is right, even if you don't have the authority to make it right. He made consistent decisions to do right, which gave him the moral authority to persuade others to do right. And that's something that you and I can do whether we have title or not. And the last person is Esther. She overcame her fear by a greater commitment to her convictions. And I would say that that is the way that you're going to get past uh, your fear of loss, of what? Loss of respect, loss of, uh, of esteem. Like every difficult choice that we're making represents a loss of, of something. She saw her position as a tool to be leveraged rather than an idol to be worshiped. And truthfully, everything you own is a tool to be leveraged for the glory of God or an idol um, on which you put too much value. I think all of us are afraid of losing something. Um, and in the choices that we make on a daily basis, whatever we choose to do is the yes that we're making, but every yes that we make is a no to something else. And I think the wisdom from the book of Esther is to choose the right no. Every difficult choice comes with a cost, whether it's to work on your marriage, right? Like that's the right thing, but sometimes, I mean, truthfully, staying in this marriage is gonna cost you something. It's gonna cost you your pride because you're gonna to have to be humble and serve the other person, even if the other person doesn't serve you back in return. You see what I'm saying? Like sometimes the easiest thing to do or the thing that my, my feelings want me to do is to bail on my family, to bail on my responsibilities, to bail on my commitment and my vow to my spouse. But I have to make the conscious choice to do what is right, even if doing right is going to cost me something. To give God 10% of your income, um, my wife and I are obedient in our giving to God and we're generous in giving to God. And, and even in saying yes to God, there's a lot of other things that I could do with that money. Like I've got kids in college. I've got kids who are trying to buy their first home. I've got plans for retirement. And if I were to say no to God, I could say yes to a bigger retirement at the cost of being disobedient to God though. Do you see what I'm saying? So a yes to this is a no to God. A yes to God might be a no or a lesser than of this other thing. Uh, a yes to forgive your abuser is you letting go of the right to hold that against them for the rest of their life. Um, you choosing to defend someone against a bully might cost you being bullied. Do you see what I'm saying? Like doing the right thing is always going to come at a cost. If you were to choose to do the right thing by sitting next to the stinky kid at lunch who's always sitting by themselves, like that would be the right thing to do. Like that's an Esther move. But there's that Esther choice in our heart where we go, but if I start sitting by the stinky kid, the one that everybody else makes fun of, who's by himself, who needs somebody to show them love, then maybe everybody else starts picking on me too. 
right? There's a cost to saying yes to God and redrawing biblical sexual boundaries in your relationship. There's a cost to making regular fellowship with your church family a priority. There's a cost to doing everything you should do. Uh, but there's also a cost to not doing those things. Jesus said that if you want to come after me, you must lay down your selfish ways, take up a cross, and follow me. And I'm wondering what we thought he meant when he said that choosing to follow him would involve picking up a cross. I think the implication is that doing the right thing is always going to be the hard thing. Some of you can't see God anywhere in your life right now, but he is there. And my encouragement for you is to keep doing right and see what God ends up doing. You are where you are for a reason. Look for that reason. Remember that God is writing a bigger story than just your own. Yes, you are the main character in the story of your life, but you are also a supporting character in the story that God is trying to write in the lives around you. Play your part even if it costs you something. Be like Esther and say that you will do what is right. And if I die, I die. Because truthfully, Jesus himself had to make that choice when he said, nevertheless, not my will be done, but yours when he chose to lay down his life for you. And all God's asked is that you return the favor. Let's pray. God, each one of us are facing very tough moral choices, uh, family choices, financial choices, choices that affect our future, choices about what we do with our past, choices about how we manage ourselves and the relationships, the influence, the resources that we have at our disposal. God, I pray that we would recognize that every choice uh, involves saying yes uh, to something and saying no to something else. I pray, God, that your side of the equation would be the one that gets our yes. Uh, and my encouragement to you right now in this prayer time is what's the one area of your life where you've been telling God no consistently? And are you willing to turn the no into a yes? I can't make that choice for you. I hope you will. God, let your will be done in each one of our lives. Help us to dr be driven more by our conviction over what is right than our fear of something wrong. That's my prayer. I ask this in Jesus' name. And we all say together, amen. Hey, well, thanks for spending some time with us. If you missed out on any of the weeks of this series, you can always catch up. Just head over to our YouTube page to find all of the weeks from the series. If you're new to our church, I'd love the opportunity to connect with you and get to know you just a little bit better. Just text the word new to the number that you see on your screen and let's connect. Also, if there's anything that I can be doing to pray for you, or if you're in need, please just reach out and let me know. You can connect with me anytime by texting the number that you see on your screen or send me an email at online at that'sgrace.org. That's it for now. Like always, we're going to end our time together with some music to help you reflect and get ready for the week to come. Narrow as the road may seem I'll follow where your spirit leads Broken as my life may be I will give you every piece I hear you call I am available I say
Nothing is a sacrifice Use me how you want to, God Have your throne within my heart 